Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here today to change the way you think about disability, sex, and sexuality once and for all, and to explore with you the power of social labels and how they have the potential to impact on a person's life in both positive and negative ways. For example, what was the first thing you thought as you saw me walk towards the red circle this afternoon? Or perhaps the first thing you've assumed when you've heard me speak. Despite what you may think, or perhaps have already assumed, did you assume correctly? I can confirm for you, ladies and gentlemen, that I am a proud gay man. I'm also an occasional drag queen, a senior leader in the disability employment services sector, and just for balance, although to be perfectly honest with you, I don't have a great deal of that. I'm a person with disability. I have cerebral palsy. I alone can tick almost every one of those annoying, completely sometimes unnecessary and invasive diversity boxes. They all stand before you today. But ladies and gentlemen, you're in luck because today I'm not just here to talk to you. I know, right? Scandalous. I want to show you some things too. Don't get scared. <laughs> Before we get started, though, I just want to be clear that I'm in no way trying to hypnotise you. <laughs> but I totally understand if you fall in love. <laughs> we can exchange numbers later. There's no problem with that. But, ladies and gentlemen, one of the things I want to show you is something about me that attracts the most attention. It's not my boyish good looks my charm or intellect. No, it's the way that I walk. So without further ado, here's just me, the beautiful Trish, and my magic shoes. This is the way that I walk. Watch closely. Now I can feel the tension in the room building. <laughs> you're all staring at my butt, and you're all falling in love. But ladies and gentlemen, because of this, because of the way that I walk, I give myself the coveted title of Australia's cheapest and most convincing drunk. <laughs> That's because I cannot tell you the number of times that I have been refused entry to pubs and nightclubs based purely on the way that I walk as a result of my cerebral palsy. And on occasions, I've been ejected from these venues even after explaining that I'm not drunk 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that I'm a person with disability. I have cerebral palsy. I've been labelled many things in my life. One includes pufta. These are used as attacks on me on many occasions throughout my life. But I've also been labelled a faggot a spastic, and a retard, just to name a few. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I know that you might be confronted by that language, but as a 38-year-old man, I still confront that language as I stand before you today. But more importantly for me today, more importantly, I need to make an apology to you the audience. Hashtag, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry because what you will discover today is I'm not inspirational. I'm not amazing. I'm not outstanding. And in fact, I have the greatest desire to be anything but exceptional. There is the greatest chance, however, that what you will discover from my talk is nothing. Yep, absolutely nothing, except I'm just like you. In Australia, we are obsessed with labelling people, and this has happened to me all my life. And in fact, ladies and gentlemen, I put to you that if it wasn't for society and successive governments constantly reminding me that I was a person with disability and a person who is gay, I would most probably forget about it. I mean, I'm a busy person. I've got shit to do. <laughs> H 
however, however, whilst I have shit to do, um, they're not necessarily the two attributes that I would necessarily talk to people about when I first meet them. So I feel like I've overshared already. It's only going to get worse from here. Hold on. <laughs> but, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand where, for me personally, those two attributes sit on a list of 50 things about me. Now, you'll be quizzed on this later, but I'm going to show you where, for me personally, being a person with disability and being a person who is gay actually sit for me on that list. And you'll notice that number five is I'm a Britney Spears fan. She's a diva, just like me. Number 10 is I have several celebrity crushes. They just don't know it yet. Number 12 is I'm a university graduate. And number 49 is I'm a person with disability. And number 50 is I'm a person who is gay. Yet I am completely fascinated by the fact that government and policymakers and even members of the community are so busy focusing on what makes people like me supposedly different or other, all the while ignoring the qualities and traits that unite us simply as human beings. I'm going to let you in on a secret. Do you want to know something? I do everything you do. And when I say everything, I mean everything. For example, I regularly masturbate. <laughs> I have sex and with men. And in my life, that's been several men. I get up every morning and I go to work. I earn a wage and I experience the same financial freedom that you experience from employment. To some, this is amazing. But I'm here to tell you that nothing I do is amazing. In fact, everything I do is just typical. And I'm not sure how, as a country, we've got to a position where we tell people with disability that doing what every other citizen typically expects to do is somehow inspirational or amazing. But then I thought to myself, long and hard, that if I were to be the Clark Kent of disability, what would I look like? Well, wait no more, ladies and gentlemen. Feast your eyes on it. <laughs> Pretty hot, hey? Even if I do say so myself. More often, though, ladies and gentlemen, people like me, and in particular people with disability, are, in my view, described by the community and by members of government using highly negative and, frankly, offensive language. I don't know about you, but how many times have you heard people with disability described using terms like this? Limitations, deficit, impairment, inability. Do you know, every time I hear people, including members of the public, senior public servants, and even in my work, ministers of government, using terms like this to describe people like me, my first thought is, shut up. How about asking me and the many millions of people just like me the terms we might use to describe ourselves? Because the one thing that you can be certain of, ladies and gentlemen, is that we would not describe ourselves using terms like this. They are offensive. I want you to think for a moment, ladies and gentlemen, that if you woke up tomorrow and your life had drastically changed, and through a set of circumstances completely beyond your control, you were labelled a person with disability, how would you feel? How would you want to be treated by your family and friends, seen by your employer and colleagues? But most importantly, how would you expect to be treated in your community? Because although we can acknowledge much positive change for people with disability, the National Disability Insurance Scheme, for example, and for members of the LGBTIQ community, momentum towards marriage equality, I say with some level of hesitation. Um, we're not there yet. 
So let us look at where we are in Australia in 2017. Almost half of lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender people hide their sexual orientation or gender identity for fear of discrimination and violence. According to some reports, same-sex attracted Australians have up to 14 times higher suicide rate attempts than compared to their heterosexual peers. 2.2 million Australians of working age have a disability. I'm just one of them. 46% of people with disability are not currently in the Australian labour force. Contrast that with 17% of people without disability. This next statistic will sicken you. Today in Australia, 90% of women with intellectual disability will experience some form of sexual assault in their life. And it may shock or perhaps even horrify you to know that Australia, the so-called lucky country, ranks 21 out of 29 OECD countries for the employment participation of people with disability. I just want to be clear there that in that equation, number one is the top, and coincidentally, my favourite number 29 is the bottom. 21 is not good. We've got lots more to do. But it's at this point that I want to talk about the cup of coffee in the room. Because, ladies and gentlemen, what you may not know is that tens of thousands of people with disability are already in employment. And they are working for a wage far less per hour than the cost of that cup of coffee that you pick up every morning on your way to work without a second thought. This is, despite a High Court decision that found this practice to be discriminatory. And I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, would you do your current job for $3 an hour? And if not, why not? And if not, why then are we so willing to accept this as a reality for some of the most vulnerable citizens in our community. Now, it's true to say that these statistics paint a very bleak and sad reality of what life is like for someone just like me. But it also amazes me that as a country, we constantly fail to recognise the importance and value of diversity in all its forms. As an example, how, why has it taken so long for our community to recognise and harness the potential of someone like me? And I can tell you why. It's because of the ever-present weight of low expectation. And that is present today for everyone with disability. And we need to change that. So to do that, I wrote a book, Anecdotes of a Disabled Gay. I affectionately call my book my own personal collection of the shit people say to a 30-something-year-old disabled gay man. But I wrote the book for two reasons. One, to shed a light on what people say to me, but two, because I also have been the subject of disability discrimination. I also have been the subject of exclusion. I also have been the subject of unconscious bias. And I see it every day in my work as a leader in the disability employment services sector. Highly skilled, talented individuals shut out and excluded, all because of the power of a social label. This has to improve, ladies and gentlemen, because each and every one of us could tomorrow be a person with a disability, and I'm sure you would want something better than this. I've come to understand that this is a conversation we all need to have, and I've just been the one to start it. While for the longest time, all I thought I was to people was a poofta, a faggot, a spastic, and a retard, I come very quickly to understand that that was only what they labelled me. It is not, and nor will it ever be, how I see myself. My parents taught me a very valuable lesson as a young person, and that was simple but transformative. Just be, just be me. Never apologise or compromise that for anyone. And I'm always going to call out discrimination and social injustice when I see it and hold a mirror up to our community 
and say, why is it that we feel so uncomfortable to engage with people with disability in a respectful and sensitive manner? And how do we indeed value the members of our LGBTIQ community? And what does this really say about us as a country? Ladies and gentlemen, to sum up, I mentioned the word leadership a few times in my talk. And I understand that as a leader, what comes with leadership is responsibility. And I will always be a leader that holds a hand out to those who need it most. I will always be a voice for the voiceless, a power for the disempowered, and a change agent for everyone. And if I was to ask you now that all I've ever wanted in my life as a person with disability and a person who is gay is to be treated equally in my community and by my country, would you now think that that was too much to ask? I fundamentally believe that if we can change minds, we can change lives. I hope I've changed yours today. I'm Wayne Herbert, the Disabled Gay.